Now let's talk about the paper. I truly enjoyed reading the paper. And by the way, I recommend uh, the book. The book is really uh, great. Uh, you know, if you want to have like uh, understand about stewardship of different uh, countries, uh, this is the place to start. Uh, the paper has a lot of stuff going on. I guess I was, you know, I was I was invited to present it because I'm a legal misfit. I guess I know, but, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, it talks about stewardship, it talks about controlled companies, it's a com you know, comparative law paper and a political economy to some extent paper. I'm not going to talk about uh, the comparative law aspect, probably because I agree with almost everything that Dan has just mentioned. We need to be careful when we talk about uh, Anglo-American law and try to implement it. We need to understand that there's a lot of hidden motives for countries to adopt uh, um, laws that were created for different jurisdictions and work best for problems that don't exist in your own country. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the corporate governance aspects and try perhaps to present a different uh, way to think about stewardship codes and their role uh, uh, for countries with controlled uh, companies. Uh, the paper says that stewardship codes are a misfit because uh, they work or they're justified only when institutional investors collectively control public companies. We know that in other countries we have controlling shareholders, so that's why we don't need stewardship codes. I disagree with that statement. Now, I had another I had a, a discussion with Dan, and, and we, you know, I don't think we are in, in, in disagreement as a matter of principle, but I think the justification for stewardship codes could be presented in a slightly different uh, way. Uh, I must start by talking about like uh, uh, the UK having the first uh, stewardship codes, and I, I didn't copy the seven principles, but the seven principles are disclosure of policies, uh, managing conflicts of interest. So in 2008, Israel adopted uh, its own version of a stewardship code. The word didn't exist there, but it, it had almost all uh, uh, the components. It was a committee chaired by uh, Yes, I mean, I know that you look and you say. I know, I know that you look and you say it can't be. That he looks so young. He, he must have, you know, it couldn't, it couldn't be that he was doing that in 2008. But actually, this is not true. And uh, you know, Lucian was the advisor to the committee. Eugene Candle, who's our you know, friend of ours, was also a member of the committee. And. We adopted some version of a stewardship code, like most legislation in Israel. This is the Middle East. We don't believe in soft law. It's kind of mandatory. But we made some adaptations to take the fact that we have concentrated ownership into account. Now, this is a secret. I think you know, it's, it's enough time to say uh, that if you look at the report, most of it was copied from the US, right? You know, I, was the ch I was the chairperson of the committee. The US didn't have and it still doesn't have a stewardship code, but many pieces, many pieces that exist in the UK stewardship code, like disclosure about voting, right? This is what all finance people, uh, this is where they get all the data from, right? You have, uh, since 2004, there is disclosure. There are different rulings that talk about, you know, duty to vote and avoiding conflicts of interest. And I think this is raises like one question, which is, you know, the UK was maybe the first to put, it, to put it in kind of a framework of a code that people could copy it, but pieces of it, you know, pieces of it, of it existed even before uh, 2010. Now, my major point is about the misfit. Why do we think that this is a misfit? And the reason presented in the paper is that institutional investors uh, don't collectively control public companies outside uh, the UK. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about that for a second. Now, clearly, controlled companies pose different governance uh, concerns than uh, widely held companies. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's no role for institutional investors. And here, I just put like a list of papers by people that were either here yesterday or I thought uh, uh, or sh uh, uh, should be here. Not surprisingly. Many of them talk about like Israeli data and, and what institutional investors do here, but not all of them. So, for example, Kobe Castile's uh, paper from two, you know, 2015 has the best title, I think, of all of those papers. It talks about against all odds, how shareholder activi activism works at controlled companies. And, and I think 
the missing piece here, the missing piece here is understand the interface of institutional investors and the existing investor protection regime, right? Because most of those uh, cases of institutional investor stewardship are tied to different rules of investor protection that empower minority shareholders, that empower minority shareholders uh, to make some or veto some decisions like majority of minority votes on self-dealing transactions and, and so on. And, and this is an example from Italy, for example. So Italy has uh, rules that allow minority shareholders to nominate uh, to nominate some uh, uh, directors to companies' boards, and, and that's why you see that's why you see some forms of institutional investors' engagement, even when you have controlled companies. And, and I think this raises the question: this raises the question: Why did Israel in 2008 and 2006 uh, think about creating rules for institutional investors' engagement? Um, it wasn't because of the absentee landlord problem, it was because of the notion that you know, institutional investors have fiduciary duties to their investors, assets under management as a result of pension reforms are increasing and we want to make sure, we want to make sure that they do the right thing vis-a-vis uh, -vis their own investors. And by the way, one of the things that we did in that committee then is kind of tie institutional investor stewardship to those areas where Israeli law empowered minority shareholders to make decisions. So they must vote, but only if you have a majority of minority voting requirements. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to kind of force institutional investors uh, to vote. And, and finally, finally, some comment, I'm not an expert, I'm not an expert on the UK, but some comments about the way the need, the way the need for stewardship in the UK is presented uh, in the paper. It's presented in a way, you know, uh, uh, in the absentee landlord problem is if we don't have stewardship, we have ownerless companies. And, and in my view, some of the statements there are kind of too strong in, in, in several respects. So one of, the, you know, one of the assumptions mentioned in the paper is that institutional investors in widely held jurisdictions have the legal right to control most listed companies. Now, for lawyers that deal with like, who is a controlling shareholder and who isn't, this is kind of like, uh, uh, raises a lot of uh, uh, um, questions. Clearly, that wasn't the intent, right? Clearly, that wasn't the notion that we want them to legally control those companies. The intent was we want them to be more active in monitoring management. And that also ties uh, to actually one of the thorniest questions whenever you talk about uh, stewardship in companies that are not controlled, and that is you know, the extent to which they could you know, coordinate their actions, coordinate their actions with other and uh, the UK has this very complex acting in concert rules that talk, you know, that trigger the mandatory beard requirement. And on the one hand, the stewardship code kind of pushes investors to cooperate. On the other hand, investors are not too eager to cooperate because they're afraid that that might trigger uh, different types of legal obligations. And kind of similar in principle questions arise. Similar in principle questions arise. Uh, in the, in the US. And again, this all goes back to the question, is it the case that we have stewardship codes because we want institutional investors to be the owners of the corporation or just because you know, they're important players and we uh, uh, need them to play uh, some role, we need them to play some role in exercising uh, their rights over uh, the companies that they control. I don't have the time, so I'll just say that I completely agree with the points about now that you're going to take uh, uh, stewardship into the ESG directions, that's going to you know, make it kind of the comparative part uh, even more complicated and raise much more interesting questions. Uh, but I'm out of time, so I need to you know, thank you for an excellent paper and thank you, Benny, for you know, running this conference for so many years. Uh, and then I think this is your cell phone. Okay. That your your suggestion to have so there, there's a chapter in the book which was in this paper, but the black reviewers told me to take it out of the paper. And the chapter is called "Can a Global Legal Misfit Be Fixed?" Um, 
shareholder stewardship in a controlling shareholder ESG world, which does exactly what you're talking about. It talks about related party transactions, it talks about minority rights, and it juxtaposes stewardship in a controlling shareholder world with you know, how, you, how you use the other mechanisms that you would, under corporate law, use to deal with controlling shareholders. So I completely agree with that. There's a whole chapter on that. But the paper, as you know, it, it had many things going on, so I sort of agreed with the reviewer to pull it back um, in that sense. The, the other quick point is that uh, I have another project that I'm doing on comparative law on acting in concert. And so I completely agree. There's this tension that nobody really talks about, which is the tension between the push for stewardship and the fact that that gets you into problems with mandatory big rules and acting in concert, which is fascinating. The Europeans talk about it, but on a global level, this really hasn't been explored. And what is even acting in concert globally is something that really hasn't been touched. The final point is acting collectively, the sentence you, you highlight, I agree with you, but the point was not that we want institutional investors to actually exercise their, their, their votes collectively to actually run everything. But it's in the shadow of that power that's important, right? So in the UK, it's not the idea that they're actually going to do it, but rather that they have this backing them up, right? And, and that, that causes a different engagement than when you're 6% and the other side of the table is 51, right? If you say, you know, like in the US, you can, like the Gilson board, you can tee up the opportunity and then they'll come in behind. There's nobody to come in behind, right? And, and so it, it's not that you're actually voting them, but that, that, that there's a different shadow. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you, Benny. I'm, I'm, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a professor at the uh, Stephen David Ralph Solomon. And uh, I really appreciated the paper. And I just, um, uh, I mean, taking a step back, I just, I just was fairly curious listening to this paper because when I think about the U.S., I, I, do know, I do think that we have lots of controlling shareholders in terms of dual class stock. And if you look at sort of the shareholders that, um, you know, live the ESG, whatever you define it, um, goals the most is the controlled companies, right? The dual class stock companies. And so that all may be endogenous and there's lots of things that are going on. And I just wonder if in terms of stewardship and, and the needs for stewardship, um, whether we just miss the point of the mechanisms that we're trying to get at. And so in the US, I think uh, the takeover market functions much better as a control for sort of corporate purpose or otherwise and saying shareholders, companies are, are vulnerable, right? <laughs> They're not. And you know, I think we ask too much of these institutional shareholders to do things because then we get Larry Fink telling us what we should be thinking, right? And so I just wonder if the whole sort of stewardship code and control companies is really just meaningless and we're just sort of asking institutional shareholders to do something that other mechanisms in the market do that we should encourage, like shareholder activism the M&A market and otherwise. And all this is going to collapse anyway now that oil's returning, you know, 150% and tech companies are not. But, but I mean, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we had a paper yesterday in the Hoffman Yassin paper in Greece about how those that invested in me, she lost money. <laughs> um, but I, just, I just wonder if we're just focused on the wrong so I would agree with I would agree with that point. I think that that, that stewardship is that stewardship is not not designed for this. So then to force it into dealing with this controlling shareholder problem is probably asking too much of the institutional investor, right? And then you know you get carried away with this, and, and, and I can't make statements. And my you know you're the one who, who should talk about the United States and not me. Um, but you know in the sense of you know. Within the jurisdiction, I think, um, yeah, you know, th th there's a tendency to, to to look to stewardship or to look to inter institutional investors for too much. I would like to make a small correction, which is the U.S. actually does have a, a quote-unquote code, right? But it's one that was done by Blackhawk State Street Fidelity. They all got together. Jill Fish wrote the chapter in the book on the U.S. Um, and, and it just hasn't gained any traction because it's one of these institutional investor launch principles that does follow these seven principles. But again, it's far different when you're dealing with a, a, a quote unquote code that's been issued by, by the institutional investors themselves as opposed to government regulatory agency. Just, just to follow up a little bit on uh, the previous question, um, I'm not sure whether we ask 
countries in the U.S. institutional investors are too much or too little. Uh, but I do think that uh, in, in terms of the stewardship and uh, how effective it is and whether it's a problem that you know one country is copying, all of us are copying from the U.K., is really to start analysis, what is the base level of stewardship and what is the base level of governance? Because if you have a very high base level of governance, the fact that they're copying or not copying, who cares? Right? The point is where you hide it, and uh, maybe it's in the book, but I'm not sure that I've seen it in your presentation, to analyze really what is the, what is the real impact, uh, both, the le both the base level uh, uh, sort of and the change, and I think this is something that is very relevant to the uh, to analysis. So it's a great question. I, I guess the, the impact has been de minimis largely. Right? In, in the UK, they admitted it themselves. In the Kingman Review, they said the last decade that it's been entirely ineffective. Um, and that, that was a full-scale review of the last 10 years by, by Kingman, an official government report. So the fact, and around the rest of the world, what has it done? It's done these other functions. Of course, you don't pass a piece of legislation if you're doing it to the government agency or institutional investors don't do these things for no reason. But in terms of a corporate governance function, it's done, it's done very little. This, this is a damning commentary of this, of this stewardship movement. So, yeah, the, the, the chapters in the book go into this in detail, but it's not the expected result, which is that this is going to show meaningful increase in, in the incentive structure that causes institutional investors who otherwise don't have incentives to monitor to actually monitor. Not very much of that has been drawn. Yes. Last question of Melissa. So it's more uh, two comments. So one is that uh, I really like the presentation for two reasons. Is that it seems to me that uh, this uh, tendency to steward, uh, stewardship uh, is that uh, all companies and all capital markets want to tend to look uh, equal. And a bit is, uh, if I think of Romy work, I think that in the US stock market, all stocks have uh, to trade at 300. Uh, they have to have a nominal value of 300. One other thing is that world class shares are bad everywhere, and the other is poor shares. The other reason why I really liked it is that if I think of the presentation of uh, Lucian Betchuk paper yesterday, the problem there was uh, cap, um, shareholder value maximization was uh, capital labor, right? But that is uh, the stakeholder-oriented thing in a place like Japan with the zombie means uh, that uh, you are really not maximizing value. Actually, that's what we need. Uh, it is a more uh, short-term. Uh, uh, oriented uh, uh, companies, right? So, but I'm wondering uh, is uh, this controlling shareholder block uh, the possibility of institutional investors to act? And uh, I'm wondering whether you have ideas of what uh, should be done in a more propositive way.